Um, I would like to tell a story, a true story, about a Holocaust survivor. I met him at a, um, a Friday night dinner at my in-laws' house. And they were both survivors and they had many dinner guests, um, often survivors. And uh, while we were, after we started the meal, I noticed he passed across the um, table uh, food and I noticed his sleeve slide up. And his sleeve slid up, I saw the numbers start to come out under his sleeve and I knew that he had been part of the slave labor force in Auschwitz. But that's not something you ask survivors about because it's um, not a good dinner topic. Um, but after dinner, when we were having uh, tea and coffee, uh, we had more small conversation. Uh, and he asked me more of what I did. And I talked about teaching, and he asked what I taught. I told it European and Russian history, and he asked if I taught Europe. And I said, um, yes, I did. And he wanted to know what I taught about Germany. And and I said, well, I talked about Hitler coming to power. He said, well, well how do you tell how did he come to power? And I started naming some things about a Reichstag fire and uh, declaring a single party state. And he said, but I want to tell you my story about how he came to power. And so he began to tell me a fascinating uh, series of incidents that happened uh, in his village. He lived near, his, his family lived near the Polish German border. And everybody had gone to bed, and one evening uh, there was a knock upon the door, bang on the door, really, and he ran down into the pajamas, and they grabbed a hold of him. Uh, these guys were brown-shirted uh, Nazis, grabbed a hold of him and accused him of stealing a hat, and uh, hauled him out and uh, threw him in a truck with other men. Uh, he couldn't figure out what he had done to deserve this sort of arrest. Uh, he said he had defaced some of Hitler posters, he was a social democrat politically, but his, it was a small town and what he had done the Nazi party would be interested and he couldn't figure it out. So he um, was driven through that night in his truck and all through the next day into another night. And at this other night he wound up at some sort of camp with lights and uh, dogs barking, his truck was full of men, they don't have a bucket for a toilet, they were tired, exhausted, they hadn't had any food or water, they were drug out of the truck and lined up. And then they had to do uh, calyx and exercise, calisthenics, so jumping jacks, push-ups, jumping jacks, push-ups, and if you couldn't continue, if you couldn't get back up, they hit you with these rubber tungsons. And these guys were around in black uniforms, which were his first contact with SS uh, soldiers who run the concentration camps and German shepherds barking at them constantly. Uh, the beatings went on, the beatings went on until no one could get up, and then uh, they were drugged and thrown into a barracks. And he thought, well, we survived that. But the evening had only just begun. Because then what happened, a door at the end of the barracks opened, and SS came in and grabbed one man out of the group and drug him to an adjoining room, uh, which was in hearing distance. And what they heard was uh, beatings, continual beatings, screaming, beatings, then all would get quiet, and then the beatings would start and the screaming would start again. And so this is the way the next few hours went. They came in, that man did not come back into the room. They came and got another man and uh, took him into this room. And we assumed they were being beaten, but we didn't know exactly what the nature of this was and said, until it came to my turn. And he was taken into his room, which was a single chair, and he was strapped to this single chair, and his legs pulled out from behind him, and they began to beat the back of his legs, to beat his tendons. First one leg, he said he, then he passed out, he didn't believe he could have so much pain on the back of your leg, and then they uh, revived him and began to beat his other leg. Uh, there were three, four men in the room, some were smoking, they were taking turns beating on him, and then he was drug out of the room into this other barracks across, sort of, remember, the gravel pathway or something, uh, to another barracks, and we were just left there in this room with these other men. And you'd also notice that there weren't as many men uh, as there was had been during calisthenics, so his best guess that some of them had not survived the beating because they were all ages in this group. And then, after several days of crawling, he couldn't stand up. Uh, he had to crawl across the floor to the bucket for a toilet and crawl across the floor to get a bowl of food, and this went on for days, and then uh, there was an inspection, an SS officer came in and demanded uh, all the 
uh, to stand up, stand up. And some could, and most couldn't. And he began to round and beat on those who couldn't stand up. And when he came to me, he said he kicked my leg. Most of he'd been kicking others in the back, apparently. But he kicked my leg, and I still had on the same pajamas and my uh, soaked with pus, and the pus splattered all over his uniform. So he went into a rage and began to beat me and beat me. And then he left. Uh, later that night, a uh, truck came and they loaded us all in a truck and we figured they're going to take us off uh, to an execution, burial in the woods somewhere. This is the end. But then the truck uh, started uh, continuing on through the night and the longer it drove, a weird thing sort of crept into our, our minds that uh, why would they waste gas driving us far away if they were going to kill us? Uh, so it was just a little bit of hope, but the, then we saw a light outside the, the truck canvas and it kept on driving into the day. And then the truck suddenly stopped. So maybe we're at an execution site or someplace else, we had no idea. Came around to the back of the truck, grabbed one man, pulled him out from under the canvas, threw him on the side of the road, got back in the truck and drove off. And so this repeated over the next few hours, dragging a man out of the back of the truck and throwing him on the side of the road until they drove me out and threw me on the side of the road truck drove away. And there I lay beside the road. I crawled up to the edge of the road. It wasn't a busy road at all, but when a vehicle went by, I put up my hand, tried to wave, and people either ignored me or slowed down a little bit and kept on going until a car mercifully stopped. A man felt that I was in trouble and uh, helped me into the back seat of his car. I couldn't get in there and asked me where I was from. I named my small town, and he said, well, I'm not going there, but you need help, and I will take you there. So this, this man took me there. And uh, looking back on it, I wish I had taken his name, because I was in such pain, I was just wanted to go home. And so this man took me home to my family, which I hadn't known what happened to me all this time. They'd gone down to the police station, asked and if they couldn't get any information, and so, uh, I stayed at home for um, months before I could walk. Now what I did, and I want you to know a little bit about this town. In this town I repaired things. I was very talented with metal. I, I fixed things, farm equipment, clocks, uh, uh, skillets, I did welding, all sorts of things. I was Mr. Fix-It Man for this town. We all go to school and everybody knew everybody. I, uh, but when it was time to go back to my shop, I wanted to get back to the shop and start making some money for my family, um, it, uh, it occurred to me that uh, the world had changed somehow because when I went to my shop and put up the open sign and figured that people would start coming by because I hadn't been there for many weeks, no one came. And when I walked home in the evening, no one would look at me. No one would talk. And so this became the pattern, it, as if somehow I was now diseased uh, because I had gone away and something horrible had happened to me, uh, no one wanted to be near me, no one wanted to talk to me. I mean, classmates from high school, nobody wanted to be around. Ultimately, I had to leave the town. Uh, and um, Irwin is the survivor's name. Um, he said, that's how they did it. All right? They did it uh, by uh, terrorizing a few and making everyone else was silent.